Hello, this is Bible Academy for Children. I'm Pastor Teacher Curtis Omo, and today we are in John chapter 11. We started chapter 11 in our last lesson, and we'll continue in that chapter today. Well, before we get started, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins and that we allow ourselves to be controlled with the Spirit of God. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity and privilege and everything you've provided so that we can study your word. We ask that our hearts and minds be open and ready to receive your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's just go back and begin to read at the beginning of chapter 11, the translation that I have, <clears throat> beginning in verse 1. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus, of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was the Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. So the sister sent word to Jesus, saying, Lord, the one you love is sick. But when Jesus heard this, he said, This sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he, that is, Lazarus was sick, he then remained two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you. And are you going there again? Then in verse 9, we notice that Jesus begins to tell one of these descriptions of things that go on. Verse 9, Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of the world. Now, a few moments of interpretation. Jesus is the light. Let's just get that verse up there by itself. Verse 9. Jesus is the light. Another lesson we learn is that there's so much time, uh, only, almost so, there's, only, there's only so much daylight. So this tells us that his time is limited because in this description, he is the light. So, the one who sees Jesus as the light of the world are his followers, the disciples. As long as they stay with him, that is, being faithful followers of Jesus, they will not stumble because they avoid the darkness. Now, since Jesus' time on earth is now coming to a close, it'll be only perhaps a few months before he goes to the cross the disciples' time with Jesus is now on a countdown clock, going all the way to what we call the Passion Week, the week in which at the end of that week will be his crucifixion. Now let's talk about some application. As long as we are walking in the day, by that, that means to walk with the Lord in the light, we will not stumble. We will not stumble spiritually. For us, this is the three of the main elements of the Christian life is being spirit controlled. It's when you give yourself over to, um, let me correct that. That should be a capital S. Holy Spirit, you're spirit controlled. All right. You are growing in the Word. That means you're learning, you're believing it, and you're applying it. All right? And then in doing all of that application and spirit control, you're going to live a life of obedience. This is walking in the light. This is staying in the light. Now, had the disciples 
stay with Jesus, even when they go back to the area of Jerusalem where it's dangerous, they're going to be perfectly safe. Well, so we've had the positive side. What happens if we stay in the light for us today? We have the Spirit to enable us. They didn't have it quite at that time when Jesus was still walking the earth. Now let's look at the other side of this, verse 10. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. The one at night is in spiritual darkness. He stumbles spiritually into sin, into evil, into all types of things that will make him quite miserable on this earth. The light in us would be Jesus, the indwelling of Christ, along with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The unbeliever has none of that. Now for the listeners who hear this when Jesus speaks there at the place where John the Baptist had been, it was an opportunity for them to realize that Jesus was the light. They had heard so much of what John had said, now it's time to listen to what Jesus has to say and believe in him. So the final lesson for us out of these uh, two verses is as long as we walk in the light, we won't get into trouble spiritually. We stay with the light. We walk with the light. Now that doesn't mean that, let's just get a little circle here. Let's say this is us. This is the light. As long as we walk in the light, that doesn't mean we won't get attacked by outside forces. In fact, darkness, not only the world, but the flesh, but the devil and his demons can try to attack a believer. What we should do is always walk in the light. Now, let's talk about some application for Jesus' disciples right there and then when they heard this. It sounds like they were nervous about going back to Jerusalem because they had just tried to stone Jesus uh, shortly before and their lives could be in danger. But if they're walking in the light, Jesus will protect them. And there's another application there for us. As long as you're doing what God wants you to do, no matter where you are, no matter who's around, you're just as safe as you could be. Jesus will protect you. And when we are out here on the busy Houston highways or whether you're out on ship at sea and you hit a big storm, or perhaps you join the military and you go into combat, you're just as safe as you would be at home in bed when you're walking with Jesus. Okay? Well, Je Jesus finished teaching these lessons, and then in verse 11, he's going to talk about Lazarus. He, referring to Jesus, said these things, and after that he said to them, Lazarus, our friend, has fallen asleep, but I am going that I may awaken him. Notice Jesus says, our friend. It's the, yeah, Lazarus is, is a friend of the disciples too. doesn't tell us, but I expect that this, this house where Lazarus and Mary and Martha was, was probably one of the places that Jesus and some of the disciples stayed when they were in that area. Now, the question. Did the disciples learn the lesson about staying with the light as long as Jesus was there? Because now Jesus is about to leave and go towards Jerusalem. He says, but I'm going that I may awaken them. Now Jesus knows what he means when he says, I may awaken him. And we know too because most of us know the story. So the sleep that Jesus talks about is really his death. But the awakening is going to be Jesus bringing him back to life. Now, as Christians who have read the Bible, we are quite familiar with the term sleep representing death for believers. Um, so we hear the term sleep, we shall all sleep, or we uh, uh, are, are 
he went to sleep. We don't usually use that in modern English in our day, but in the Bible we see it in a couple of places. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11.30, 15.51, and that equals death. Death. Death for the believer. Okay? So when Jesus says he's going to wake him, that means he's going to wake him from death. All right? He's going to raise him up. Raise up so you're up and walking around again. Jesus has a deeper meaning to his words. The disciples don't understand them. So all I'm saying is that now we know the story, and we know in other places the Bible refers to death, uh, or sleep rather, representing death. But the disciples didn't. So when Jesus uses the term sleep, they're kind of stumped about what he means for sure. So we get to verse 12. The disciples think Jesus is talking about real sleep, but listen to what they say. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. You see, the disciples just understood sleep as, well, like we go to sleep at night and wake up the next day. They think he's really asleep, and if he's sleeping, it will give him time to recover from his illness if he gets some rest. And that's what they mean here in verse 12, and also tells us they did not understand the deeper meaning of the way Jesus was using the word sleep. Well, John decides to help out the readers by helping us with the interpretation of verse 13. But Jesus had been speaking concerning his death. But they thought that he was speaking about the rest of sleep, or literal sleep. The sleep you do at night, you see. Or maybe you like to take a nap. I do that now and then. 14. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Now they know what he means by sleep. And then he goes on to say something important, and this is a little hard to follow, so you want to pay close attention. And I'm glad for your sake that I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Now what's this all about? Well, Jesus says that Lazarus is dead. And then, I and I am glad for your sake, for you disciples, for your sake, disciples. There's something here. There's something in this for you, to your advantage. And I am glad for your sake that I was not there. That is, back there was Lazarus when he died. And here is the reason, so that you may believe. Now, what's Jesus talking about? Now, we've learned a lot about belief in the book of John. Let's talk about some of those before we come back to the answer. We've seen that there are different levels of belief, that people can grow in their belief. And by that, I mean their faith gets stronger. All right, so you can grow in your faith, and by that I mean you find that believing the harder things becomes easier. Did you hear me? Believing the harder things become easier, and that's what happens when you grow in your faith. Um, for example, you probably believe uh, that the sun's going to come up tomorrow morning right that's not hard to believe right what if someone said you know it's going to get so dark tomorrow afternoon we have to turn all our lights on you say that's pretty dark i'm not sure i want to believe that you see what i'm saying but this person says well you know i know all about these things about when it's going to get that dark and then it happens just like he said. What if this happens again the next week? He says, tomorrow it's going to get dark, just like it did last week. You think you'll believe him a little easier? Yes, you will, because you believe and you've grown in your faith towards that person and what he says. He's easier to believe, isn't he? 
Now you believe him the second time, and again, it gets dark, just like you said. How about the third time? No problem, I believe you again. And it happens, you see. That's kind of a silly example, but still, we grow in our faith when we increase our trust in someone. And as the disciples go with Jesus, and they watch him raise this man from the dead, their faith is going to grow. It's a lot easier when you see Jesus raise some from the dead and later he tells you, you know, I'm going to raise you from the dead. Why is it easier? Because they saw Lazarus raised from the dead. Do you understand? Sure. Well, the other thing we learned is that Jesus did works. They were sometimes signed miracles. And sign miracles made people realize this man's from God because that's a supernatural act. And these sign miracles point to Jesus as the Messiah, a man who was also God, sent from God. Jesus also spoke words. And they were to learn to, be to believe those too. And then they could learn what Jesus said about him being the Messiah. You see? So there's different things we believe. We believe the works. We believe the words. We can believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And we have different levels of belief also. So, Jesus is saying, you disciples are going to have a good opportunity to grow in your faith. Now, at the end of that verse, Jesus says, but let us go to him. Now, his disciples have an opportunity to go with Jesus to see this big event. They don't know for sure what Jesus is going to do, except they've just been taught you need to stay in the light. So, what do you think they're supposed to do? They're supposed to stay with Jesus. Say so they'll go with him, and one of the results is going to be is that their faith is going to grow. Listen to what Thomas says in verse 16. Then Thomas, who was called Didymus, it means the twin, so he must have had a twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Well, Thomas is rather enthusiastic here. His heart's in the right place. His thinking is, you know, if we go and Jesus is going to die, we'll die right with him. Well, that shows some courage. Uh, Shows loyalty to Jesus. He's ready to do what Jesus had called people to do if they believe in him. And that's be ready to, call, uh, to carry the cross, which meant to even die alongside the Lord if that was to happen. The problem with Thomas is he doesn't really remember, as well as he should, the lesson about being in the light. As long as he was in the light, he's not going to stumble. And in the same sense, as long as he's doing God's will, doesn't mean he's going to die just because he goes with the Lord. It doesn't even mean the Lord's going to die right away. Eventually he will, of course. Well, so will Thomas, for that matter. But the thing we want to see here is that Thomas should be ready to go with the Lord and not necessarily think it's going to be his time to die just because they go there. He's still under God's protection. He will die just like all of us when God's ready for us to die. Now the only exception to that is if we decide to not do God's will and we start messing up in our Christian life so severely that we get disciplined so bad that the Lord takes us home early. That wasn't in the plan for what was best for us. Thomas's problem, like so many, is he doesn't understand what Jesus was talking about earlier regarding walking in the light. Because Jesus will just as well keep you safe as he will give you life at the resurrection. So it appears Thomas was thinking about the dangers. But at least he thought that if he had to die, he would go with the Lord. But, you see, he wasn't quite right on all of that. Verse 17. 
So when Jesus arrived, he found that he, that is Lazarus, had already had been already in the tomb four days. Now, when someone's in a tomb, now remember, a tomb is like a, well, it's like a cave. And it's just like you're probably familiar with when Jesus was put in the tomb, they put him in sort of a dugout place in the side of a rock, uh, side of a small mountain or hill, and they roll a stone in front of it. Well, Lazarus is already in the tomb, and he had been there four days. And this tells us something. Because remember, the messenger left Bethany. Remember, there was Jerusalem over here. Bethany nearby, all right? There's a little bit of travel time. Then there was a, the River Jordan. Then other, on the other side, there's another Bethany, all right? This is one day's travel to walk that far, all right? Between Bethany and Jerusalem, it's less than two miles. It'd probably take you maybe... Uh, less than an hour to get there. All right? So, the messenger left to go over to Bethany. That's one day, right? One day. Jesus said, let's wait a couple of days. He stayed there a couple more days. Then they traveled back. All right? Making another day, coming out to four days. So, Lazarus must have been buried right after the messenger left to get that many days. So, he's been in the grave for four days. Now, that's pretty important because that means he's dead and gone. Right? He's in the tomb. He's been in the tomb. They closed it up. And he's been gone for four days. Now, let me just mention this for a moment. Depending on where you live, you have different customs about what happens when someone dies. Usually people go through a grieving period. Uh, here in the United States, often uh, they put the body in a funeral home and then they take care of it and fix it all up and put it in a casket and get make arrangements to have it buried out in a cemetery. All right, that can take a couple of days. And around the third or fourth day, people will start to view the body and get ready for the funeral, and then there's a funeral. So less than a week, it's all done. All right? In the ancient world, uh, in Israel and Jerusalem, the people would most always take off seven days for mourning. All right? However, they would bury the dead, the dead body often the same day that person died. And there's reasons for that. They didn't have all the stuff to preserve bodies and keep them from smelling and stuff like they do today. But they would usually put them in the tomb this, the same day if it was still enough daylight to do so. And they would do that and go ahead and seal it. Well, when Jesus arrives, the body's been in the tomb for four days, and the family's mourning, and they're still at home. They stay at home mourning, except for visiting the tomb, perhaps taking some flowers or something, and going there and remembering a little, uh, you know, going out to be where his body is. It be it by yourself. It gives you time to think about him, and perhaps a time of prayer. And then the whole family will pretty much just stay out of society or stay out of their routine for 30 more days before they go back to normal. Or within this seven days, you can add 23, I think. You get about 30 days that the people are out of society. Then everybody goes back to work. But in this seven days, family comes in. You know, this is the week that he died. They come in, they visit. And back in those days, you had to give people travel time, so a day or two for people to get there, and, and then they would probably have some time where they'd talk about him and that type of thing. Well, anyway, Jesus arrives, like, in the middle of this morning. So where would the family be? Back at their home. Mary and Martha would be back home, mourning and grieving their brother. Relatives would come down. Friends would come down. 
And then we get the note in verse 18, and we just saw this on my little map. Now, Bethany was about two miles near Jerusalem. That means it's about just about two miles away from Jerusalem. Uh, today it would be, in fact it is, when you look at a map, it's a suburb of Jerusalem. Many of you probably live in a suburb. Basically what you have is as you have the town of Jerusalem, okay? Then over here you have the Mount of Olives, all right? Then over here is Bethany. So here's Jerusalem, Mount of Olives, then you have Bethany. Jesus is over here, so they're going to have to go back, go, probably go down there and go through the uh, east gate to get in Jerusalem. But this is where Jesus and Mary and Martha are going to be. In a little bit. We're not quite there yet. They're still talking about Mary and Martha going through the grieving period. Verse 19. Now many from the Jews, among the Jews, had come to Martha and Mary to console them over the loss of their brother. Console means to comfort. If you've ever been at a funeral, you know that people go there and try to comfort and console people. Uh, console the family who've lost their dear loved ones. Now this is the Jews who would be their friends. It's not the authorities in this case. Sometimes we use it for those Jewish authorities, but not in this case. It's just Jews. Verse 21, 20, 20 and 21 together. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But Mary stayed in the house. Martha then said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now, this tells us a couple of things. This shows us Martha's confidence that Jesus could have healed him. So he wouldn't have died. Uh, she understands his power. She knows something about Jesus that a lot of people still hadn't learned yet. Verse 22. She continues, Martha continues to speak. Even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Now we're not really aware of what she had in mind. I don't think there's anything here that tells us she thought that Jesus would resurrect him, especially after four days in the tomb. All right, it's one thing. If you go back and look at the other resurrections, they're most, almost immediately after that person died. Not four days in a tomb, a cave tomb. But Martha is confident that whatever Jesus wants to... God to do that God and him are in such good tune are in tune together um, they're on the same page on the plan of God that that the father would do it but it appears that Martha is leaving this open to whatever Jesus wants to do remember he had already raised at least two people that are recorded in the other gospels does Martha think Jesus might do this? Probably not. Um, but whatever Jesus decides, she's confident that God's will will be done. Then listen to what Jesus says to her. Verse 23. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Now, Rise again. Let's talk about that. Notice, first of all, it's in the future tense. All right. He will rise, will, in the future. Sometimes we use the word shall. He will rise again. This word also means just to stand up. But it also has a meaning that has to do with the resurrection, the official resurrection when the dead are raised. Okay? So Jesus says your brother will rise again. Jesus hasn't told her that he's going to bring him back to life. So how do you think she's going to take this? She will take it as the resurrection. The resurrection time. 
Listen to what she says in verse 24. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. So she's talking about the resurrection when all believers are going to be raised later on. We sometimes call that the rapture. Let's draw a little timeline. Okay. Here's the cross. Here's the coming of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2. New Covenant Church gets started. All right, right here. Jesus is already up in heaven by this time. He's at the right hand of the Father. All right, this is around 34, 33 A.D. We're over 20, we're in 2017 right now. Still going. After today, what well, could happen today, I guess, where I'm at, when Jesus comes back a second time, what we call the second advent, the second coming over here, when he came first Christmas, this was the first advent, or the first coming of Christ. His second coming, at that time, all believers will go up to meet him in the air. That is the resurrection. All right? That's the resurrection. When all those have died, if it happened today, uh, that would mean that the dead in Christ would rise first. Those buried would go up first. All right? And then those walking on the earth, there's one walking on the earth, he'd go up right after them, all getting new bodies. Well, so that's the resurrection Mary's thinking about, which makes sense. She doesn't know Jesus is going to raise Lazarus from the dead yet. But listen to how Jesus answers her after she says what she did. Let's look at what she said again. She says, I know that he will rise again, talking about Lazarus, and the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. Notice Jesus says, I am. This is another one of those I am sayings. Remember, he says, I am the bread, I am the light. Now he's saying, I am the resurrection and the life. Now let's tie those two things in together. Resurrection means someone is dead and buried, okay? Let's make this just the burial ground. I am the resurrection. He comes up, and then he's given life. So they're tied in together here, you see. Jesus says, I'm both of these. Just like he was the bread, just like he was the light, he gives life. So he raises the dead. We studied that when they hear his voice, he will make them alive. That's in chapter 5. So this is a way of saying, of Jesus saying, that the resurrection and the life comes through him. So Jesus brings the resurrection and the life. He's taught that he gives life. So in this one statement when he says, I am the resurrection and life, he's saying, I'm the one who does both of those for you. But then notice what he says at the end of this verse. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. Now, notice again, what tense is will live in? Future, isn't it? Future. So he's, here's what he's saying. Will live. That's future, right? So let's get a timeline down here. 
I haven't done this yet. Let's see how it comes out. If it's in the future, let's put this right here as the present. We'll put this as the future. All right. This is where we are right now, where I'm talking to you. Now, let us me read this sentence again. All right. He who believes in me, let's write this word in me over here. He who believes, he who believes in me, that's Jesus Christ, will live even if he dies. So what's going to have to happen between him living and the present? There's going to have to be a death. So if we were to play this out, today we are alive. In the future, we're going to die. We'll just end it right there, okay? Death. Jesus says we'll live even if he dies. So after death, we move this over to here. We'll live. So what's this telling us? This is telling us that even when we die, we will live under one condition. What is it? Believes in me and Jesus. This is really simple when I do it this way, but that's what he's saying. I'm the resurrection of life. I'm the one that's going to do this right here. He who believes in me you believe in me when you die right here after that you're gonna live why why does Jesus say that how can he say that because he says I am the resurrection and the life that's pretty important for Mary to know, or Martha to know here. And for her to know this after her brother died, is in the tomb, she can know that Jesus is going to take care of her brother. Anybody who believes in Jesus, and Lazarus had done that, will be raised after their death. But notice the major condition that has to be met by the person who's going to be raised after death. He has to believe in Jesus. So Jesus assures Martha that he will be raised, that he will come back in the future after his death. Now let's look at the next verse because it ties in together with verse 26. But I'm going to read 25 and 26 together. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, notice, in me, will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die forevermore. Do you believe this? Now let's look at the first line of verse 26. And everyone who lives. All right. Well, there's nothing complicated about this really everyone who lives that would be everyone who's ever had life you me anybody anybody else with you who's alive that's everyone who lives everyone who lives and then we have the same thing we had in the previous verse believes in me that's Jesus. Now what has Jesus already called himself in this in these in this previous verse? He's a resurrection and the life, right? 
You believe in Jesus. You believe he's a resurrection life, right? Everyone who lives and believes, let's write the and in, and believes in me will never die. Now, Jesus is talking about spiritual death. In other words, in the spiritual realm, when a person dies, his spirit either goes up or goes down, to put it simply. Either you go up to be with the Lord in heaven, or you go down to torments. Often we indicate that with fire. Sometimes we call it hell, a real place. But when you die, your spirit is either going to go up or it's going to go down. If you are spiritually alive, spiritually alive, that happens the moment you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you will never experience spiritual death. That will never happen to you. You will never die. Never, never, never. This word for never in the Greek language, we don't have this in the English, but it has two negatives. You know, a negative to us is like not, right? Or no, or never. This is like saying, we'll never, ever die. So we translate it, we'll never die. Or will not ever die, something like that. Definitely not die. So here we go again. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And then we have a word that you won't see in some of your translations. But it's there. And what it means is forever. Forever more. Now we don't use that word very often, but it is there in the original text. Never die forever. That's what it's saying. You will never die forever. And that doesn't make really good English for us. So we use something like forever more. A lot of your translations just leave it out and put in the word never. Saying, well, that's enough. They get the idea. You see? And that gets the meaning across if you just want to stay with that. But what this is telling us is that the believer in Jesus Christ will never die spiritually. So what happens is, when you as a Christian die, and you have your human spirit in you, all right, and that human spirit has a special relationship with God, when you die, you leave this body. Let's just make this circle your body. All right? You leave that body and you go right up to be with the Lord. Now listen. That happens the instant that a Christian dies. Just as quick as you can snap your fingers. You're there with the Lord. So, though your body dies, that's what we talked about in verse 25. You, who you really are, will never die. Now listen to that. You will never die. And that's what Jesus is saying. You will never die for all eternity. Forevermore. Now let me ask you the question that Jesus said to Martha at the end of this verse. Do you believe this? Well, if you're a Christian, you should. You should have no doubt. This is why we don't fear death. Now, it gets kind of scary if we get almost died, but then we start to thinking, oh no, I'm just going to be at the Lord. Right? Of course. 
Listen to Mary's wonderful answer, or Martha's wonderful answer. I keep saying Mary. It's Martha. When Jesus asked her, do you believe this? Listen to what she says. Yes, she said to him, yes, Lord. I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who comes into the world. Well, let me put this simple. She is saved. She believes everything she's supposed to believe about Jesus. He's the Christ. That was the Greek word for Messiah. He's the Son of God. Not only that, she also believes the things he just said about the resurrection and the life. She believes all of this. But he's really targeting about it right now. He's really targeting in on the words we saw earlier. On the other two verses, remember them? The in me. Do you believe in me? Yes, she does, Lord. And not only that, she adds what she knows of him, that he's the Messiah and he's the Son of God. And when she says, I have believed, let me tell you something about the Greek language that kind of is important to know here. They call it a perfect tense. We don't have a perfect tense like this in the English, all right? Now, we do have a perfect, but it's not quite like this. In the Greek language, if we get another timeline, we've had several timelines here, right? And let's divide this timeline up into three sections. One, two, three. And we're going to make this one the past, and this one the present, and this one the future. In the, in the perfect tense, now listen to this. Maybe you want to learn Greek one of these days. When it says, I have believed, what this means is, is that she believed this in the past. And the emphasis is right now in the present. This is where the emphasis is. All right? And this is what she's saying. She's saying, in effect, I'm a believer. Some of your translations will translate this in the present to show that this is what she is right now. And that's what she's saying. I, ha I believe. I have believed. Meaning that I right now am a believer. So she is saying, I am a present believer. That's her status. And to Martha, this is a settled issue with Jesus. She believed who Jesus was in the past so much so that now anyone can say to her, you're a believer. And in saying that, I have believed, she says two very significant things about Jesus. First of all, that he's the Christ. Well, that's the word for Messiah. He is the Messiah. She's one who understands that. She calls him the Son of God. Now, that says a lot of things. He has the traits of the Father. Uh, later on, they learn more about that, and they clearly understand that Jesus was God. It also means that. I don't think she knew that just yet. That was still something they were learning. See, their faith is growing too. And at the end, she says, who comes into the world. And what have we learned about that? Well, that's being sent. He's the one who comes into the world. Now, he came in the world in a very special way, didn't he? The virgin birth through Mary, in combination with the Spirit working upon Mary. So she also understands that he's a sent one. He just didn't come like any human being. He was sent by God. In her mind, she believes all these things about Jesus. This is true to her. She even acted on it with faith, saving faith. All right? Well, this is a wonderful verse to end on. Let me read it one more time when we look at Mary, uh, excuse me, I almost said it again, Martha's Confession. Jesus said, do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who comes into the world. And we will see that woman in heaven one day. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we thank you for your word. It's been another one of those lessons that's been helpful in so many ways for us to understand what it means to believe in you. 
and we're going to be seeing more here soon regarding the raising of Lazarus and the power you have to raise us one day after we die. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit. Challenge us with the things we've heard today. In Jesus' name, amen.